Um, today, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, trauma and define it. And uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. We'll periodically check in and I'll answer those questions as soon as I can, as quickly as I can. Today, <clears throat> we're coming from the Children's Assessment Center. We have a couple of brochures. If you're online, please Google us, the Children's Assessment Center here in Harris County. Our mission is to provide a professional, compassionate, coordinated approach to the treatment of sexually abused children and their families. And we also serve as advocates. We have over 50 partners to include law enforcement, the school districts, um, FBI. We have a plethora of professional entities that a couple of professional entities that work in conjunction with us to make sure that we are ensuring the safety of children and treating those who have been traumatized. So understanding childhood trauma. With the CAC, which is the Children's Assessment Center, we started this work back in 1991, where probably each year we serve over 5,000 children. Um, membership with a plethora of entities and agencies um, with the same mission to make sure that those that are traumatized by sexual abuse, that we have a safe place, safe haven to treat them and to help with the healing process. So in addition to working with our partners, we make sure that we deliver services, um, psychotherapy, play therapy, just a myriad of therapeutic approaches to helping our families and helping these children heal from specific trauma. So today's learning objective, we will talk about trauma. So you're not gonna learn everything about trauma. As we know, the definition has evolved over many years where they add into to provide um, a comprehensive explanation on trauma. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about it. Then we will also talk about the impact of trauma. And furthermore, we will discuss support for supportive services for those that have been victimized. So what is trauma? We have a little video that we're gonna show. everybody, my name is Zoe, and this is my friend and special correspondent, Jacob. Hello, I'm Jacob, and you can probably tell that I'm just visiting here. In just a minute, I'm gonna sing you a song, but for now, I'm ready to listen. Are you ready to listen? Now it's Zoe's turn. I'll be right back. Thanks, Jacob. Today we want to talk with you about something that can be hard to talk about. I want to talk to you about something called trauma. So what is trauma? Well, a trauma can be something really bad that happens to you and you may have some very strong feelings about it or feel like things just aren't like they used to be. It might even be something where your life was in danger. I'm going to tell you about some things that a lot of kids experience that can be a trauma. Did you ever know someone who's been in a bad car wreck? They may have been pretty shaken up and had a hard time after. They might even be afraid to ride in a car after the wreck. It's normal to be a little scared or worried about riding in a car after that happened, don't you think? But it's not just a car wreck that can be a trauma. Let me tell you some other things that happen to a lot of kids that can be a trauma. Sometimes adults can hurt kids or touch them in their private parts. Sometimes it can even be a person that you love or that loves you that does it. It can even be someone in your family. When someone hurts you, touches you, or doesn't take care of you, this is called abuse. I want you to know that there is just no excuse for abuse. It's never a kid's fault for getting hurt by an adult, even if you broke the rules or did something you weren't supposed to. Sometimes trauma can even be things that you see or hear, like someone getting really hurt or maybe seeing or being in a really bad storm, like a hurricane or a tornado. It's 
it's normal to feel upset after something bad happens, and I want you to know that there is no rule as to how a person is supposed to feel or react following a traumatic event. No two people will ever respond in the exact same way. You might experience strong feelings of sadness, worry, or fear. You might even think you don't even have any feelings at all. You might also feel like something bad might happen again, or you might feel scared or jumpy. It also might be harder than usual to concentrate on schoolwork or other activities. Some people have nightmares or trouble falling asleep. You might have thoughts about the trauma that happened to you even when you don't want to think about it. You might also try to avoid people, places, or things that remind you of the trauma that happened. Sometimes people even feel like they aren't really there, like you're in a dream or a movie. Lastly, you might blame yourself for the bad thing that happened. Remember this, it is normal for anyone to have really strong feelings after something bad happens. It's also normal to want to talk to someone about your feelings. If you catch a really bad cold, it's normal to cough and sneeze, right? And it's also normal to go to the doctor, right? Well, it's also normal to talk to a therapist or someone you trust about your trauma. It doesn't mean you're sick. It just means that you want to feel better. The National Child and Traumatic Stress Network defines trauma as an event or series of events that involves fear or threat. And what we also know that it's even, it can even occur when you perceive a threat. There's also a word called vicarious traumatization or secondary trauma. So maybe you didn't directly see the car accident or you didn't directly experience the shooting at the mall. But the mere fact of hearing it repeatedly or experiencing the after effect from a loved one or someone who was part of that can be traumatic on a person. I recall being an early social worker where my primary line of work was working with those that were victimized by sexual abuse. So day in and day out, I'm reading documentation, case studies, um, actual caseload of children that were sexually abused. And then all of a sudden, I re remember just feeling really odd and not understanding what was happening. And I remember having to converse with my supervisor at the time. I said, something's wrong. Because I'm dreaming about this stuff. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing the kids that are on my caseload. What's going on? And this was back in the early 90s. And then I was advised, oh, that's secondary trauma. You have um, what is perceived as vicarious traumatization. Because I didn't experience the sexual abuse from the client. But just reading it day in and day out and treating it. And then wanting to you know, save the world and save this particular uh, child um, that... I um, was working on and just knowing that it can transfer because it's energy, negative energy. And so we want to be mindful that there is such thing as traumatic, you know, secondary trauma or um, the traumatization experience um, vicariously. And then we know now there's a such thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. And we'll talk a little bit later in our presentation. Trauma is also defined and explained that it occurs when both internal and external resources are inadequate to cope with external threats. So you have all of this negative energy, whether it's fear, anxiety, um, maybe you're hypervigilant. It doesn't have a place to go. And so what it does, it'll manifest itself in possible psychosomatic event, whether now you're you have tummy aches. Well, I'm so used to talking to little bitty ones. Maybe a stomach ache. I guess anyone over 20 no longer has a tummy. So um, it can manifest itself um, as a headache or tummy ache. It can also manifest itself in mood and behavior uh, to interfere with normal, healthy functioning. And then at the moment of trauma, the victim is rendered helpless by overwhelming force. How many of you have heard of the response of fight, flight, or freeze? Many times when a person is victimized by trauma, by the event that results in trauma, their brain is trying to make sense of everything. So it can automatically shut off a region of the brain. And that's the freezing part. So when you have someone that may have been abused and then you hear, why didn't you yell? Why didn't you scream? Or maybe someone was assaulted. Why didn't you yell? Why didn't you say anything? Well, their brain, the region of their brain just kind of temporarily shut off with those, um, that connection, and they were just literally frozen. 
That's why they weren't able to move or jump or scream or yell or call for assistance. And then clearly flight is that person that's able to do something in terms of running or yelling or responding um, to what's happening. And then the flight, the fight is, you know, not, well, not always physically the fighting part, but being able to articulate your concerns to have your needs met. Stop. I don't want this. Leave me alone. I need you to uh, list decide on tabling this discussion or tabling this particular event and not going any further away with exacerbated to something that's harmful. What is trauma? So audience, Give me an example of a single event that could be perceived as traumatic. So something that happens one time. 9-11, perfect example, very traumatic. It happened once and it's been, we just, we just honored, was it 25 years? 20 years post 9-11. And you still see the impact that that event has on so many people. What about reoccurring trauma? In addition, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, domestic violence, just ongoing domestic violence, things that are constantly occurring. And we even know now, because of research, that if a pregnant woman is exposed to domestic violence, that child in utero, in that mommy's stomach and her tummy, can also experience trauma. Because whatever mom eats, so does the baby. Whatever mom experiences, so does that child. And so what we know, the chemicals that are exchanged, during, even during that process, can result in trauma. So that infant that um, is having difficulty eating, having difficult expressing their needs in a healthy way, can be the result of experiencing trauma while in utero. Complex trauma. Complex trauma could be prolonged exposure to something where the person is just simply unable to emotionally or even physically process. And then it becomes detrimental on their health, especially mental health, making it uh, very difficult for them to function. And then intergenerational trauma. So that's probably a new one. Um, but then the last few years we've been talking about in our mental health community. What might be an example of intergenerational trauma? And then I'll explain a little bit on it. They're talking about a certain tradition, certain things that occur, and it's defined uh, things that are passed down from generations to generations. So if you think about slavery, and it's difficult for many of us to talk about that or even hear about it. But if you think about that generation that experienced it, and then the following generation may have some residual things from that, and then so on and so on, that's a real thing. That's a very traumatic event. My great great grandmother was part of that horrible culture. And it's I'm just four generations from that. If you think of Holocaust survivors, they too are part of that intergenerational trauma. If you think about war, what if, and we're so privileged here in America, what if we were in a country that had that constantly have war, generations experience it, and then maybe the third generation, they're having to be part of the fight of their grandparents, constant warring. So that also creates intergenerational trauma. What causes trauma? Well, life experiences. So every event doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be traumatic or perceived on the body as traumatic, even sexual abuse. And I bring up sexual abuse quite a bit because the Children's Assessment Center, that's our primary focus. And so you'll hear a lot of reference um, to sexual abuse, but we realize that there are a plethora of things that result in trauma. So life experiences, we know domestic violence is going to cause trauma on so many levels. And I mentioned earlier that pregnant mom that is experiencing directly a firsthand domestic violence, that baby's going to be impacted in utero. What do you think happens to the little two-year-old that's watching or the five-year-old? 
What happens if that teenager is witnessing domestic violence? It's going to possibly jump in and want to help mom or render some form of assistance. And then, too, watching that, that child is also impacted by that. Physical abuse. You mentioned if one parent talked a certain way to the child and then so on, and then they grow up and have children, and it almost becomes normal, that verbal abuse, emotional abuse, that physical abuse passed on generation to generation because there aren't any instructions that come with the delivery of a child. How easy would it be for social workers and therapists if there was, hey, congratulations on your new baby. Oh, here's a parenting manual. How great would that be for us? Witnessing war or genocide. Again, as Americans, we don't see that so much. But outside of our little safe little bubble, our safe little island, it's happening outside of here. What is the most recent event that um, you may recall in terms of another country having to leave their area of war and destruction and come here to the U.S.? Absolutely. Afghanistan. Yeah. So we're fortunate to have some form of protection from those particular experiences where you're absolutely right, they are coming um, because they're fleeing from things that are traumatic. And so we know that it's not always physical abuse or sexual abuse. It could be the weather. Think about Hurricane Katrina. How traumatic was that on so many levels? I had the steam honor of hopping in as a therapist um, at the Astrodome and to provide therapy. And I was told, make sure you have your ID, just go and find a need. I went out there and was able to do play therapy with several um, of the children. And this, I'll never forget this. I wish I would have brought her her work, but um, she's about four years old. She drew a picture of a house and then she took a blue crayon and she aggressively drew over the house. So as a play therapist, I'm like, whoa, look at this. Uh, but no, I didn't show my relation like that with her. And then I asked her to tell me this story. She said, this is my house. And this is all the water that came to my house. And she was four. She was four. And so we know weather, storms, disaster, natural, now, natural disasters also can be very traumatic. Emotional abuse. Unfortunately, there are mean girls and mean boys outside, out there at schools. And so when we're working with the child that is self-injurious, all of a sudden, this happy-go-lucky child um, is returning from school or maybe stating not wanting to even attend school. And then later we find out that they've been bullied. Being bullied can be a traumatic event on a child. We have too many, and I don't have the exact statistics, but one child is way too many, where a child has committed suicide because of bullying. For that child in that space, it was traumatic. And I remember a time period where, so in my generation, it was, you know, rites of passage. If somebody bullied you, you beat them up and call it a day. And so now we're not just beating up folks anymore. And so what's happening, these children are being, they're suffering from the emotional and the physical abuse of their peers. And that can be traumatic, especially when they take their own lives because of the traumatic event. Death of a loved one. There's a thing entitled traumatic grief. So even watching or experiencing the death of a loved one, that too can be deemed as traumatic. Of course, neglect, um, because you're being deprived of basic human rights um, that can interfere with you on so many levels, including health and safety, that can be traumatic. Uh, we mentioned about natural disasters um, and parental mental health issues. How might that be traumatic? And I can't wait to see some of your answers online. I'm gonna give you a ghost star. <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, children rely on the safety and security of caregivers. And so if a parent doesn't have it for themselves, where is the child going to get it from? So the young lady that received the gold star mentioned that if the child, if the parent has, you know, mental illness and unable to care for the child, then that could induce trauma. So now there's fear of where I'm going to eat, where I'm going to get food from, how I'm going to get to school. If you taught or told at school that if you miss, if you have so many attendants, are children, and I'm sorry, are adults given detention because the child is tardy from school or missed school because the parent was unable to get the child to school? What if the parent is mentally ill and hadn't done laundry? So what we know that mental illness also impacts self-care needs, self-care issues. If a parent is not well, then it's going to interfere with the security and the safety for their child, which is an issue regarding nurturance. You can't give what you don't have. What about that intoxicated parent that can't wake up? to send the four-year-old to the bus stop to go to school. Now you have a four-year-old trying to fix lunch or fix breakfast, which is all very trauma traumatizing uh, for children. Children depend on their caregivers for their survival. Um, they organize their behaviors to survive. And that oftentimes we know that when a child has been traumatized, it interferes with their ability to feel safe. And if they don't feel safe, many times they feel helpless. And what we need to do is clearly provide a healthy, safe environment. To this day, we know that, and, and it, it has evolved, of course, where we can talk about traumatic events, we can talk about trauma, we can talk about treatment. And so when we have those opportunities, um, clearly here at the Children's Assessment Center, we try to do our very best to help families. Common reactions to trauma, anger, confusion, sadness, worry, fear, hurt, guilt, and despair, embarrassment. You mentioned that child that has the unclean clothes or uh, appearing disheveled, having children to mock them can be very embarrassing for them. Um, panic, betrayal, denial. I'm fine. How many times you've heard someone that experienced an event? I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. And what happens, they're masking all of that negative energy, that unhealthy, unsafe energy, just hovering it inside until someone cut them off while driving or something else happened or um, a misunderstanding at work or something with their spouse. And then it all, it's all unloaded. And of course, shame, anxiety, minimization. We see that quite a bit. And self-blame. How many times have you heard folks say, oh, it was my fault. I shouldn't have been walking my dog late at night. Or it's my fault. I, what was I thinking? Which makes a, a setting for uh, just lack of treatment for that unresolved issue as it relates to trauma, an expression of trauma. More trauma symptoms, avoidance. So a traumatic event can manifest itself in phobias. So now that avoidance, I don't want to go to school anymore because of that one bully. So that avoidance it's not just impacting your inability to see the mean girl or the mean boy, but it's interfering with your ability to become educated, to learn skills from school. And what happens if you don't have basic understanding, uh, academic understanding? You're going to get left behind. Isolation. Trauma will look like a phobia. It's going to feel like it. It's going to present itself because now you don't want to walk outside. You don't want to open your door. You want to withdraw and people can't check on you. You want to stay in bed underneath the blanket and you don't want to bathe. If you're there, if a mother of four, and let's say they're from two months 
to 12, she's so engulfed in trauma where she that she isolates and doesn't want to get out of bed. Who's taking care of those babies? Who's taking care of those children? Intense fear and worrying. That's where the anxiety, panic attacks. What if trauma is so intense where every time you smell a certain scent, it triggers memories of a traumatic event? That will happen. Intense sadness. Um, the connection with that is depression. Feeling melancholy. Flashbacks. How well could a person focus if everything, anything triggers a flashback or a memory? So we know the brain is so sophisticated, it stores memory. Now, we can't, we can't push a button and say, well, I want to remember this today and not that tomorrow. Just flashbacks can be very intrusive. And so untreated trauma can result in that region of the brain where you will have those reoccurring flashbacks of trauma, of trauma. Reenactment. What, and I know this is very difficult to hear, but unfortunately it happens. And this is why we have the Children's Assessment Center. When you have that three-year-old that's been sexually abused and now they're six acting out on their two-year-old sibling, they're reenacting trauma that occurred, especially um, in an unhealthy touching situation. So a child at three is not going to know to do certain things that are going to be defined as sexual abuse or sexual trauma. It's always exposure, whether they witness it or experience it. And so when you have that reenactment, it's important that we're there to treat that trauma. And then silence. I'm not sure how many of you are law and order folks, special sexual victim unit. <laughs> what about the silence? What about the person that doesn't want to speak about it? Someone is trying to help law enforcement, social workers, not some mental health agency. And you say, nope, don't want to talk about it because I don't want to think about it. I don't want to remember it. And you stay in silence with the traumatic event. I tell my teams um, that I work with that are going through uh, trauma training or trauma therapy. If you visualize an ice cube, regular ice cube, that's you, that's your brain, that's your body, that's your world, that's your functioning. But now we're going to interject green dye into that ice cube. Trauma is like frozen energy in your brain. And not just your brain, because your brain has... Um, well, trauma will have these tentacles in your body. So now, not only is that frozen trauma in your brain, now it's in your inability to get to work on time or to focus on your exam or to communicate with your peers or have a happy, healthy, well-adjusted life. So trauma therapy is imperative so we can get that green dye out of your ice cube. Because now that green dye in your ice cube is going to look like green dye in your ice cube, but it's not going to taste very well within your beverage. And unable, when you're unable to separate the two, then it's a, it makes it very difficult to have that healthy, healthy happy, well-adjusted life when you have that unmanaged trauma. Nightmares. Whoa, nightmares. And night terrors are very prevalent when a child, is, well, not just a child, think about our servicemen who've been to war. We often hear about those aggressive night terrors. What happens when you don't sleep well? It's difficult to function. It's difficult to focus, concentrate, think. It interferes with your social skills even sometimes. So sleep is very important. And we know trauma interferes with your sleep. Difficulty concentrating, stomach aches. I like saying tummy aches because I work with little bitty ones. Dissociation. So we didn't have this word. Um, it wasn't 
regularly used in the mental health community uh, 20 plus years ago. But oh goodness, um, we love this word now. Dissociation. If you think about freezing, remember we talked about how that poly theory talks about flight, fight, or freeze. So in that moment of a person being frozen, there could be some dissociation. You may have heard a person say, the attack happened or the event happened, but I don't remember how I got to the hospital. I don't remember what happened next. There's some dissociation where you have this out-of-body experience, this out-of-mind experience. And that's the dissociation part. And so right now, we are gathering up research and we are really studying dissociation. It, it's a real thing that warrants investigation and, and treatment. Difficulty sleeping. How about you can get in the bed, you can sleep, but then anything, you have this startle response where maybe a cat's outside and then you can hear it. Maybe someone opened the door, you can hear it. Just difficulty having rest. So there's a difference between sleeping and rest. And so trauma will interfere or can interfere with your sleeping. Headaches, bedwetting. We've seen that a lot with the little bitty ones, the regression of a de developmental uh, task. So uh, that child that is now potty trained or that school age child is potty trained, and if all of a sudden they start bedwetting, let's start talking about if there's anything that has happened. Did you see anything? Did you hear anything? Did someone say anything to you? Because we know in terms of abuse, there are adults who threaten the safety of children and will verbalize, I'm going to hurt you or hurt mom or dad. And having to retain that trauma inside, that secret inside, can manifest itself into something psychosomatic or a, just a physiological response, a physiological response such as bedwetting. Difficulty eating. I recall working with a young lady. She was um, middle school, I think at like 14, 15 years of age, and she had had ongoing sexual abuse. And before she reported it, she stopped eating. And she stopped grooming. She stopped her self-care and uh, grooming behaviors. And so when I received her for treatment, she was so thin, like unhealthy thin, and her dental needs had been neglected. So throughout treatment, she said, "I because I think she was a nice, plump, little, firm young lady, and the perpetrator would comment on her body. So in her head, if I lost all of this weight, he won't be attracted to me, so he won't sexually abuse me anymore. So she stopped brushing her teeth and had poor dental hygiene because she thought, well, at least he won't want to kiss me or maybe he could smell this. So if I could have now odorous, uh, you know, scent, maybe he won't, maybe he'll be, you know, he won't bother me because of it. And of course, we know, unfortunately, these perpetrators don't care. And uh, she was dying. She was dying. So stop eating. Not even bulimia, but just literally just became anorexic. And we know that that can interfere with your organs, the function of your organs, when you are not eating properly. And then, unfortunately, depression. Depression um, is part of the traumatic symptoms. Effects of trauma. New fears, tweaking problems, feeling sad. Many of these we talked about a decline in academic performance, losing interest in activities, separation anxiety. Separation anxiety because the person feels unsafe. I need my mom. I need my dad. Uh, don't leave me um, because the the trauma um, that they may experience. I think about the children that are diagnosed with ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADD, attention deficit disorder. I wonder what would happen if our educators, instead of being quickly to say, oh, you have ADHD, sit down, be quiet, ask, are you okay? Did something happen to you? Are you experiencing something? Is something going on at home? Just a check-in. Because what we know now is that ADHD looks like a trauma symptom. A trauma symptom can look like ADHD symptoms, lack of concentration, 
inability to sit still, lack of memory, a decline in academic performance because of lack of focus. And so what we're asking, when you feel like you've identified a child and not saying these babies aren't genuinely diagnosed with it, but let's take an extra step just to inquire about, hey, how are things are going? How was the weekend? If, if, are you feeling, what are you feeling right now? What we know in terms of long-term effects, smoking. So unfortunately, untreated trauma, it's gonna find a way, to, the person's gonna find a way to cope. And a negative coping practice would be things that are detrimental to your health, poor decision-making practices, um, drugs, alcohol, smoking. Because what the person is doing is, I wanna numb what I'm feeling. I wanna mask what I'm feeling. Therefore, smoking makes me feel better. How many times have you may have, well, and how many, how many times, but you may have heard someone say, you know, I use drugs because I don't want to feel, I don't want to think. If I think about it, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. If I feel the pain from the trauma, then I'm going to completely lose it. So I'm going to anesthetize myself by getting high, getting drunk. I want to be numb. Oh, share your goal star. Thank you. Absolutely. One feel numb. But what happens to the trauma? Can that green dye release itself from that ice cube? Not if it's still refrigerated. If you're in that still, if you're in that same environment, it's gonna stay. It's gonna stay in that state. Having unprotective sex, being promiscuous, um, and not even slut shaming. That's a thing but definitely making poor decisions um, because of the trauma, struggling with authority, making uh, choices that are high risk and unhealthy, and uh, psychiatric conditions as a result of untreated trauma. How can we support children? So in addition to treatment for children um, at the Children's Assessment Center, we provide services for adults as well. If you suspect child abuse, you don't, here in Texas, you don't have to investigate. I'm hoping everywhere, but for sure here in Texas, you don't have to investigate. If you merely suspect child abuse or neglect, as you explore the concern, you can make a report. And here, if, who are mandated reporters? What about the mailman? You're delivering mail and you saw uh, two children. And this is a real case when I worked for Children Protective Services. The mailman was delivering mail, saw an infant. Uh, I think the baby was, in my case, um, the child was less than two and the, the other child was like three or four in the window crying, snotty nose, um, little dirty diaper and made a report for the apartment complex and then made a report to CPS. So mom had court that morning. So she left the two children at home and said, I'm going to be there for you know, a little short while. So I'm going to run the court, come back, and they're going to be asleep when I get back. That's what she thought. So this under two-year-old and four-year-old were left at home by themselves. So everyone, we all are mandated reporters. You see something, you say something. And the beauty of it, you don't have to give your name. It can be anonymously done. But you can help a child by simply being involved. And it's not a direct involvement. It's a mere fact of linking resources to get to that family to help them. Because many times people need education. They need resources. They need support to make healthier and better decision-making practices. Two, gather information. You see something, get as much as you can, child's name, uh, if you have an address or phone number, just something. Maybe you know that child's teacher, pass the information along to the teacher, and together you guys make that report. Making a report is paramount to helping with children who've been abused or neglected. Again, you're not an investigator. You don't have to. But simply making a report, advising it, learning someone. 
that something's going on. And then investigation outcomes. Um, CPS will send you documentation saying whether or not a case was open or closed. And interesting enough, and having been part of that system for so many years, they can identify if there's already a report made. So you're going to receive correspondence thanking you for your time and your interest for it, and just making sure that the child is safe. They're not going to go into details, of course, but at least you have an idea on whether or not that case was investigated or not. Also supporting traumatized families, they need food, uh, clothing, shelter, transportation, medical needs. And there's a myriad of professional agencies, um, nonprofit, this church even, have resources to uh, help families. Supporting traumatized family includes um, supporting the parents, providing concrete resources and services for them. Sometimes people just need to talk it out. Sometimes they feel so isolated, they're alone. Sometimes they feel like um, this doesn't impact anyone else. They don't want to be a burden to someone. So the mere fact of having the ear for them to, for you, knowing someone cares enough to listen for them, that's very impactful. And that's part of therapy, very therapeutic, allowing someone just to be. And keep in mind, you don't have to fix it for them. The mere process of them getting that trauma out of their body is taking that frozen ice cube out of the refrigerator. And maybe you're going to sit it on the counter and let it work itself out. So having that ear and not having to provide ways of fixing whatever that's going on or just trying to help them mitigate whatever uh, they're dealing with. The mere fact of being supported with your presence, with your ears, um, is also very impactful. Of course, we're going to encourage therapy, and that's what we do at the Children's Assessment Center. And you're also helping families understand their needs in terms of just being in a healthier place to reduce trauma. Thank you.